Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. This week I'm covering the case of Sherry Rasmussen. Now Sherry Rasmussen meets the man that will go on to become her husband in the summer of 1982, a man called John Rutten. John Rutten was two years younger than her at 25 and he was a recent graduate of UCLA. As Sherry was 27, she was the director of nursing at Glendale Medical Center in California. Sherry was crazy smart, she'd gone to university at 16 years old, she'd graduated early and she was doing really well in her life, like she wasn't even in her 30s and she was already the director of nursing. She was the kind of woman that everyone wanted to be around all the time, she was just this beacon of light. Sherry could have got any guy she wants and she chose John. The two of them get married in November 1985 and they move into a condo in Van Nuys in California. Sherry's still doing her nursing, she absolutely adores her job and John has recently got a job in engineering. But it was Monday, February 24th, 1986 when all of this changed. Now the two woke up that morning and John leaves Sherry in bed as he heads to work. Now Sherry loved her job, it was her favourite thing in the world, but every single Monday she had to sort of do this class, she was teaching all these students I assume, and she just didn't really enjoy that aspect of her job that much. So that particular Monday she was saying that she just didn't really want to go into work. John was trying to encourage her to go into work, but Sherry just wasn't really feeling it, she just kind of wanted to call in sick and stay in bed all day. So when John left her in bed that morning, he was sure if she was going to decide to get up and go or if she was just going to stay in bed um, and he needs to work at 7 20 a.m eventually unbeknownst to john sherry does eventually decide to call in sick now john arrives at his desk shortly before 8 a.m and he thinks about calling sherry to like see if she has gone into work or not but decides that if she hasn't decided to go into work then she'll still be asleep in bed and he doesn't want to bother her so he just decides to wait until mid-morning to call her so the first time he eventually decides to call her is about 10 a.m but there's no answer so he assumes that she's gone into work but just double check this he decides to call sherry's office um, and the receptionist answers and says that she hasn't actually seen Sherry yet that day, but because Sherry was meant to be teaching, she didn't usually see her on a Monday anyway. So that wasn't really much help. Nobody really knew if Sherry was at work or not. John tries a couple more times throughout the day to call Sherry at home, but of course there's no answer. But something he finds extra strange is that there's no answer machine. The answering machine just isn't picking up, and this was the 80s, so it wasn't automatic. If you were leaving the house and you wanted people to be able to leave you messages, you had to actually like, plug the answering machine in. And the two of them always did this. If they were the last one leaving the house, they would plug the answering machine in. And Sherry hadn't done this, which made John worry a little bit. John leaves work early in the evening, probably between like 4 or 5 p.m. I couldn't figure out an exact time. And he runs some errands on the way home. He goes by the dry cleaner to pick up some clothes. He stops at the UPS store, so doesn't actually get home until 5.55 p.m. Um, now the way that their condo was sort of set up was the house at the front and then the garage where they'd park their cars was round the back. And as John goes to pull into the garage that day, he's shocked to see that the garage door is actually up, which it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be up. And he notices as well that there's loads of broken glass sort of like around the outside of the garage door and Sherry's car, a BMW he'd bought her for their engagement, was also gone. Now in the moment he just assumes that Sherry's gone out somewhere and that she's smashed into something and it's either broken a car window or something else, which is why there's all the glass there. Sherry apparently, according to him, wasn't the best driver in the world, so that could have happened. But he said the strangest thing was that she would have gone out without telling him where she was going. That's the weirdest thing that crossed his mind in that moment. So he parks his car in the garage and he goes to walk in the house and you'd enter the house through a door which sort of led from the garage straight into the living room. And he becomes properly alarmed for the first time when he notices that this door is open. Now Sherry wouldn't have left the house leaving the door from the garage to the living room open and the garage door as well. And John knew that he'd locked that door on his way to work that morning. He walks into the living room where he is immediately met with the dead body of his wife lying on the living room floor. She was lying on her back on the rug. Her face was bloody and battered and bruised and her legs and arms were all raised slightly, making it look like she was trying to fight someone off. Despite the fact that it's quite obvious that she's dead, John rushes over to her body to help her, but the rigor mortis has already set in, there's no pulse, she's stiff, she's cold, 
and like he can tell that she's dead but she, he's desperately desperately trying to help her anyway. He obviously calls the police and an ambulance who all arrive very shortly after and confirm that Sherry is indeed dead. Now the pathologist who examined Sherry declared that her cause of death was three gunshots in her chest any one of which could have been fatal. There were abrasions on her wrists which were pretty consistent with being tied up with either rope or cord and I actually did find some white cord near the front door with Sherry's blood on it. There were many signs of a struggle including on Sherry's body. Um, there were multiple contusions and abrasions on her hands, mouth, face, head and neck and they found a broken piece of her fingernail near the front door. That's how hard she was fighting, she literally snapped her nails off. An injury on her face was consistent with being hit by the muzzle of a gun. There was a blow on her head that was pretty consistent with a broken vase that was found lying near her body, but none of the head injuries she received were fatal. What killed her was the gunshots in her chest. On her left inner forearm there was a very, very obvious bite mark, and based on the sort of lack of hemorrhaging and the absence of any information there, they said this bite mark was done about the time that Sherry died, if not shortly after. Even after Sherry was dead or literally taking her last breath, this person was still harming her. Two bullets were recovered from inside her body, both of them 38 caliber, and one bullet had passed through her entire body. There were multiple fingerprints and partial fingerprints found around the home and also on the BMW, which was found a couple of weeks later on March 7th, 1986. It was found about two and a half miles away from the home with the keys still in the ignition, but it wasn't damaged in any way. Nothing had been taken from the car. It just seemed like somebody had driven it away for two and a half miles and then just left it. From the scene, investigators could tell that there had been a hell of a fight. One of the tall stereo speakers that they had in their lounge had been knocked over and it was kind of lying next to Sherry's body. Um, and it was lying on the rug with all of the wires removed. Um, the vase I mentioned Sherry had been hit around the head with was lying shattered on the floor. Shelves had been knocked over, upstairs one of the glass sliding doors leading onto the balcony. Sort of the way that it worked was I think it was in their bedroom there were these glass sliding doors and there was a balcony which is actually the top of the garage if that makes sense um, but these glass doors had been shattered and this was actually the glass that John saw lying on the pavement as he drove into the garage. But there was no sign of forced entry, whoever did this couldn't have really got in through these doors um, and other than the objects left on the living room floor, no real sign of a ransacking, it looked like the entire scene had been staged. At least that's what we know now. At the time, the police were insistent that it was indeed a robbery. On the chair in the living room, there was a pink and green quilted blanket, which had a bullet hole in it and powder burns. Two of the wounds in Sherry's chest were contact wounds. So the first wound would have been caused by her just being shot from somebody maybe the other side of the room. The other two wounds were caused by somebody literally putting the barrel of the gun up against her chest and pulling the trigger. Um, but it looked like whoever had done this had tried to use the quilt to muffle the sound. So they sort of like put the quilt up against Sherry's body, then the gun in order to muffle the noise. There were multiple blood stains across the living room, including a bloody handprint near the alarm system. And this was proven to be Sherry's bloody handprint. And it looked actually as if she'd been reaching for the alarm system to trigger the alarm to alert somebody that she needed help. The detectives who originally investigated the scene came to the conclusion that was a burglary gone wrong. There had actually been quite a recent spate of crime in the area with two Latino men breaking into multiple houses in the nearby area. And in one case, these men had assaulted a woman. Now the police theorized that it was the same two burglars that broke into Sherry's house that morning and came in through an open, unlocked door. And they were surprised when they see Sherry's there because she should be at work. Sherry puts up a fight, she's six foot tall, she's very athletic, very fit, so she's not going to go down easy and the men fight with her and eventually end up shooting her. But the two Latino men who've been seen breaking into these other homes were sort of estimated to be around five foot five, so they were actually pretty short men. Um, and it just seems strange that Sherry wouldn't have been able to sort of like escape this. I know they would have had a gun and I know it's two men instead of one, but it just didn't quite add up. And the house was a very unlikely target for any kind of experienced burglar because it was in a gated complex and it was surrounded by fences with these sophisticated alarm systems. It just didn't make sense that these two burglars would target 
that particular house. Um, and the scene did look like it had been staged to look like a robbery, but very little was actually taken apart from the car. The car was the only thing that was stolen. Actually, no, her handbag was also taken as well, but it didn't go very far. It was actually found by two gardeners who handed it to one of Sherry's neighbours during that same day, and the neighbours take the bag to the police that afternoon. And nothing had been taken from the bag, everything was still in there. So if somebody had gone around her house to rob it, surely they would take something from her bag, they'd take other things. If they were ransacking the house, they wouldn't just leave it at the living room, they'd go to the other rooms in the house. But the living room was pretty much the only one that was disturbed. The same neighbour who handed the bag to the police actually said that she'd noticed something strange around 9.45am that day. She'd seen that the garage door was open, and both of the cars were gone, but she doesn't really investigate. This obviously suggests that Sherry had died very early that morning. Just a few hours after John originally called 911, the homicide detective on the case, a man called Lyle Mayer, goes to him and says that he knows exactly what happened. He says just before 10 a.m. somebody broke into the house through the unlocked front door, trying to steal the stereo, and they come across Sherry and they kill her. So within a few hours of the murder, that's it. It's all tied up in a neat little bow the police department know what's happened. I know you're all thinking, you're probably thinking, the husband clearly did it, John did it. Um, that is not where this story is going. John was never a suspect. He had a very solid alibi. He was at work all day um, and he was absolutely distraught by what happened. He loved his wife. The two were very, very newly married. They'd been married for, I think, just over three months at this point and they had no problems really during their short marriage. They were financially secure, they were happy, they had good jobs, and according to John, there was no one out there who would want to hurt Sherry. Sherry's parents were Nels and Loretta Rasmussen, and they weren't actually told what happened until the next morning. But it was very early the next morning, it was just before 1am when Nels got the phone call saying what had happened to his daughter. Now immediately, his brain gets to work. He starts thinking about who could have done this. And he kept coming back to the same thing over and over and over again. Sherry had confided in him multiple times over the previous months that one of John's ex-girlfriends was causing her some trouble. Now this ex-girlfriend was a police officer, but Nels didn't know her name. Nels didn't know this woman's name, but knew that Sherry felt threatened by her because this woman was an LAPD police officer. In the weeks leading up to the wedding, this woman had turned up at Sherry and John's house multiple times, looking for any kind of reason that she could to talk to John. On one occasion, she turns up with a pair of water skis and asks John to wax them for her. And Sherry's like not happy with this. She's like, listen, this is your like ex. I don't want her hanging around. I don't know why she's here. I don't know why she can't ask somebody else. Like, I don't want you doing this. And John's like, listen, I'm just gonna wax her skis, give them back, and then maybe she'll leave us alone. Which I think is just a very male versus female way of looking at things. But apparently this particular occasion led to this big argument between Sherry and John because Sherry just wanted this woman to go away and she wasn't leaving them alone. Um, but John assured her like their relationship was never anything serious. They weren't even like really girlfriend and boyfriend. They were just friends with benefits kind of thing. And John just, maybe he was scared or intimidated by her, but didn't want to stand up to her. And then on another occasion, this woman turns up at the hospital and comes bursting into Sherry's office. Apparently she's wearing this really tiny little tube top and these little tiny hot pants. And Sherry kind of felt like this woman was trying to make her feel inferior, like she wasn't as hot or wasn't as fit and athletic as she was. It was just very strange. And then there's another occasion where this woman turns up at Sherry and John's home whilst John is out at work. And this time she's in her LAPD uniform and she's like showing off the fact that she's got a gun there. Like she doesn't say like, oh, this is my gun, but like she keeps like gesturing to it. And Sherry takes this as some kind of threat. Sherry was getting frustrated, she was venting to her dad about it, and John was refusing to do anything about it because he just thought she was harmless. And it got to a point where Sherry stopped even talking to John about what was going on because his response would just frustrate her even more. She decided to maybe take matters into her own hands, she was just gonna deal with it. This is everything that Nels tells the police. He tells them like, have you checked out John's ex-girlfriend, the cop? I don't know her name, but she is a police officer. And the detective literally turns around and tells him that he watches too many police shows. Detective Mayer told John all of the stories that Nels had told him and John dismisses it all saying like, he hasn't heard of any of these, which he hasn't because Sherry stopped telling him. But John did tell the detective the name of his ex-girlfriend, Stephanie Lazarus. 
Now one of the few interactions that Sherry told John about with Stephanie was the hospital visit. Now Sherry had come home from work that day and she was really, really upset. She tells John what had happened. And this leads John to go on and make a confession that he had slept with Stephanie shortly after him and Sherry had got engaged. It would have been around end of May, beginning of June, 1985. Stephanie apparently that day had called him up crying, really upset. She'd heard he'd got engaged to somebody else and wasn't dealing with it, with it very well. And so she asked John if he can come round, just like talk to her and like make her understand. So John does this, he goes around Stephanie's house and she tells him that she is in love with him and he ends up sleeping with her. He later said that he only slept with her to give her closure and felt awful about it immediately afterwards. But his confession was already a little bit too late because that, it seems, is why Stephanie turned up at Sherry's office that day, to tell her that her and John had slept together. John begged for Sherry's forgiveness and clearly she gave it to him because they ended up still getting married in November of 1985. Now let's rewind a little bit and take a look at John and Stephanie's relationship from the beginning. The two of them met whilst they were at university at UCLA and they begin casually dating. The two of them were both avid athletes and their paths would cross quite a lot and they ended up sort of like starting this relationship. Um, according to John, it was never anything more than casual dating, casual sex, friends benefits maybe. According to Stephanie, they were in a committed boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. I think everyone has a relationship where you're with somebody that doesn't quite reciprocate your feelings. That's just a part of life everyone has it at some point, whether you are just having sex or dating or in a full-blown relationship. There's always one relationship in your life where it just isn't equal and it seems like that was kind of the situation here for John and Stephanie. John just thought they were messing around, Stephanie thought they were going to get married one day. So they carry on sort of sleeping together throughout university and after they graduate they both head off on their separate career paths. Stephanie is going into LAPD and John is an engineer but over the next couple of years they still meet up occasionally for sex and it really doesn't seem like the relationship was defined by anything other than sex for John and it kind of baffles me how Stephanie could have thought it was a proper relationship because they only met up a couple of times in those couple of years after university. On John's 25th birthday, Stephanie actually throws him a surprise party, not realising at this point that John is seeing other people and that I think at this point he was already in a relationship, a pretty committed relationship with Sherry. When Stephanie does eventually learn that John is in a pretty serious relationship with somebody else, she actually writes to his mother and she writes, I wish it didn't end the way it did and I don't think I'll ever understand his decision. Um, obviously she didn't give up though because she still carries on going to visit John at his condo where he lived with Sherry. And then with that we'll jump back to 1986 after Sherry's murder. Now the documents for this case are really really interesting to look back on. Um, Nels apparently brought up Stephanie's name or brought up the idea of Stephanie, he didn't actually know her name, multiple times to Detective Mayer. But Detective Mayer refused to listen but Nels wasn't the only one who mentioned him like Detective Mayer interviewed John in the days after Sherry's death and John brought up Stephanie's name himself but all the records of this are missing from the case file. None of this, Nels and John have both said that Stephanie was spoken about with the detectives on multiple occasions and this is just not in the records. Um, there are audio recordings and notes of all the other interviews that were sort of done in this case but nothing that ever mentioned Stephanie Lazarus. Um, it seems like this lead wasn't just brushed off by the LAPD, they intentionally wiped it from the records. And this wasn't a mistake, this cannot be a mistake, there is some kind of institutional bias at work here. The LAPD never followed up on this lead, they never questioned Stephanie, they never took photos or checked for any signs of injury, absolutely nothing. And there was just one very brief entry in the case file that even mentioned Stephanie's name, it was this tiny little note that said, John Rutten called, verified Stephanie Lazarus, PO was former girlfriend. Um, and the case goes pretty quiet after this. By the end of 1986, when the LAPD closed books on the year's homicide statistics, Sherry's murder is marked as unsolved. It doesn't seem like anybody's really that bothered about even trying to solve it. Um, eventually, Detective Mayer retires and Nels thinks that this is his chance. He contacts a new detective who would be in charge of the case, thinking that maybe this new detective would actually take some initiative and do something. Um, but 
This detective has the same opinion as Detective Mayer, that he doesn't think that any new leads will emerge and it's just pointless to even try. Um, but by the early 90s, and we've like skipped a solid few years here, new DNA testing is emerging, there's new technology, it's all over the news, it's the newest hot topic and old criminal cases are getting solved left, right and centre because of all this new technology. So Nels goes to the police and he tells them that he wants DNA testing done in his daughter's case and he's brushed off. They tell him that they don't have the funds and they don't have any suspects in her case so why would they want to do any DNA testing? And Nels turns around and says listen I've found a lab that is willing to do this work, I'm willing to pay for it, if you just give me the samples I will actually get this done myself and again the police refuse. In the few years after Sherry's death John actually ends up reuniting with Stephanie and I don't really know if they rekindle their relationship, I don't really understand entirely what went on, but it seems like the two of them went on a scuba diving trip to Hawaii with some other friends from university. Um, some sources said they like started sleeping together again, some sources say they just went as friends, um, but John goes on holiday with Stephanie Lazarus, and John actually apparently called Detective Mayer before he agreed to this holiday, just to double check that he was sure that Stephanie Lazarus had nothing to do with his wife's death. And John's always insisted that like Stephanie definitely didn't have anything to do with it, but the fact that he feels he needs to call up the detective just to check? suggests that maybe he did have some kind of clue. Years later, John remarries and ends up starting a family with his new wife, and Stephanie also marries somebody else, marrying a fellow officer in the LAPD, and they have a daughter together. And Stephanie rises through the ranks of the LAPD over the next few years. She begins working in D.A.R.E., which is the Drug Abuse Resistance Education Department, and Internal Affairs, and eventually she becomes a high-level detective in the Commercial Crimes Division, where she focused on art theft. Stephanie is a well-liked detective. She's very, very good at her job. By the late 1990s, DNA testing is pretty much commonplace, everyone's using it, and so the LAPD create a new unit to get people to look through the forensic evidence of old cold case files. Detectives are assigned to look through these cases and see if they can find any new leads through DNA testing on these cold case files. Amongst these files was Sherry Rasmussen's. Um, however, it isn't until 2004 that they eventually get round to looking at Sherry's case. I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds of cases that they were reviewing in this new unit. Um, and a criminalist called Jennifer Francis is the one assigned to the case. Jennifer Francis isn't a detective by any means, she is a scientist, and she's basically looking at the DNA. Jennifer gets the file and she starts to look through it, and she's absolutely perplexed because it's just a mess. There are things missing, things aren't dated properly, everything's just not as it should be. Um, but the main thing that she's focusing on is the DNA evidence. As she notices that some of the evidence that may have contained a suspect's DNA is missing from the file. All the DNA evidence she found pertaining to this case contained Sherry's DNA only, nothing from the suspect, but it was quite obvious in sort of the notes that they did have suspect DNA, it just wasn't there. One particular crime report stated that a swab had been taken from the bite mark on Sherry's arm, and this would have contained the saliva of whoever did this to Sherry. Um, only it's not listed in the evidence and it's not among the forensic samples. And Jennifer refuses just to brush this off and move on and she decides to go searching for this. She knows that any fresh evidence is usually held in the coroner's freezer whilst the case is still active and then once the case kind of closes they take it out of the freezer and then put it into evidence. So Jennifer takes a chance, she calls the coroner's office and says like, have you got this by any chance? And she actually goes down there and they search through the freezers until at the very back of the freezer they find this envelope, it's this manila envelope with a vial inside containing the swab of the DNA. It seems like it just got missed when people were moving DNA from place to place. It had been sat in the back of this freezer for 18 years because whoever put it in there didn't label it properly. The case number seemed like it had been rubbed away and they only knew that it was from Sherry's case because it had the name Rasmussen across the front. So Jennifer runs back to the lab with the swab and immediately starts testing it. And she gets the results back from the testing in January 2005. Um, she runs the DNA that came back through CODIS and unsurprisingly, there's no match in CODIS. 
But she did discover something very interesting. The DNA was female. Jennifer runs the results back to the cold case detectives and points out the obvious, that if the prevailing theory in this case is that Sherry was murdered by two male burglars, then why is the saliva from a woman? Now she knew nothing of Nell's fight for justice, that he was insistent that it was John's former girlfriend that did this, but she knows that something isn't right. Unsurprisingly, the detectives refuse to agree. They refuse to investigate the case. They argue that the burglars could have been female. That was possible. And so Jennifer had to eventually concede. She puts up a fight, but she can't persuade them to reinvestigate the case if they don't want to. And so the evidence just goes back in storage and the case once again goes quiet. It's quiet for over four years until February 2009 when the case surfaces once again. You see, there'd been a huge decrease in murders in LA over the past few years, particularly in the Van Nuys area. The LAPD had recently boxed up all their cold case files and had begun to sort of like send them out to the particular divisions from which they had originated. And so Sherry's file ends up back with the Van Nuys Homicide Unit. And Van Nuys only has like five to seven homicides a year. They had a lot of time on their hands. It's a pretty safe area. And so they begin to assign detectives to look over these cases again, just in case. Detective Jim Nuttall is the one to start sort of poking around this case. And he sees the same contradiction that Jennifer Francis had found all of those years earlier. He sees that the detectives in the case have theorised that it was male burglars, but the saliva was female. And it was clear to him that whoever had done this was a female. Jim goes to his supervisor, detective Robert Bubb, and Robert Bubb actually takes it pretty seriously and he assigns Mark Martinez and Pete Barbara to help rework the case. It was very obvious to them that the original detectives were way off the mark here, and not just because of the saliva. They looked at all of the reviews of the actual crime scene and they saw that it was obviously staged. All of the documents said that Sherry had heard something downstairs and had gone down and had disturbed the burglars and so they attacked her. But if that's the case, how was the glass sliding door in her bedroom shattered? It was very obvious to them that Sherry had been disturbed in her bedroom and two shots had been fired in the bedroom, shattering the glass. And then Sherry had possibly escaped downstairs, which is where the rest happened. It's obvious to them that Sherry and whoever did this are fighting in the living room downstairs. The person hit Sherry around the head with a vase and maybe Sherry gets this woman in a headlock and maybe this woman bites her to get her free. Very, very shortly after that, Sherry is shot three times. It was obvious that it wasn't a robbery. It was murder staged to look like a robbery. So all the detectives had to do was ask which female wanted Sherry dead and which female had the smarts to stage a crime scene. They pour over the case file looking for any clue, any name that stands out to them. And they only find one brief mention of a possible female in this case. The note that said, John Rutten called, Stephanie Lazarus verified, PO was former girlfriend. And they don't know what PO means at first until they actually have to call John. And John says, yeah, it probably means police officer. A female police officer seemed like exactly the kind of person they were looking for here. They run Stephanie's name through the police directory and find that she is indeed still working in the LAPD and that she's really high up in the art theft department. So Jim Nuttall and Mark Martinez actually go to see John and Nels and John and Nels tell them they should have all of this information already, like they've told detectives everything they're telling them before. Um, and they say that Stephanie's name was brought up multiple times and Jim and Mark have to kind of concede and say like, it's not there, it's not in the case file. So Jim and Mark make a pact. They're not gonna tell anybody what they know at this point because it's pretty obvious that somebody was covering up Stephanie at one point and they don't want this information to be heard by the wrong person. And also if Stephanie is innocent here, then it's just gonna be very embarrassing for her. So they're gonna keep quiet for a little bit. They write a list of five females who may have wanted to cause harm to Sherry and three of the five are eliminated off that list very, very quickly for one reason or another. They definitely didn't do it. And they're left with two people on the list, Stephanie Lazarus and a nurse at the hospital who Sherry had recently had an argument with. This nurse is living in Northern California at the time and Detective Bob actually makes arrangements with the police force where this nurse was living to collect a DNA sample from her without her knowing. And by mid-April it comes back and this DNA sample doesn't match. This nurse isn't the one who bit and murdered Sherry. So the police only have one suspect left, 
Stephanie Lazarus, but they're still finding it really hard to believe it could be her because she has a spotless record within the LAPD. She's very highly revered, she's a very good detective. They just can't really believe that she could be a murderer, but she's the only person left on their list. Detectives also noted that during the mid 80s, most LAPD officers would use 38 caliber guns as their sort of backup gun or off duty gun. And this was the same weapon that had been used to murder Sherry. On the 30th of April, they sort of enter Stephanie's name into the California State Gun Registry. They're looking for a list of all the guns she's ever owned. And sure enough, Stephanie did own a 38 caliber at the time that Sherry was murdered. Only she'd reported it stolen just 13 days after the murder. She said that her car had been broken into near Santa Monica Pier and that her blue gym bag was stolen and her gun was in the gym bag. This gun was a Smith & Wesson 38 caliber revolver. This caused a bit of a problem because with the gun gone, there was no way to prove or disprove that this was the particular murder weapon. Um, and also I wanna say that I find it highly unlikely that it was actually stolen. It's more likely that Stephanie disposed of it. Um, but she obviously had to tell the police it was stolen. At this point they knew they had no choice but to try and get Stephanie's DNA. Now for weeks they'd been surveilling her, they'd been sending plain clothes detectives to follow her no matter where she went, she was being followed. And one particular day she is at Costco and she's drinking a drink um, and she throws a drink once it's done in a bin and the detective following her literally goes to the bin and scoops up and puts it in an evidence bag and they run off for DNA testing. It's tested and it comes back shockingly as an exact match. Now they just had to figure out what to do next. The art theft department was on the third floor of the Parker Centre, which was just across the hall from the Robbery and Homicide Division. Now Jim Nuttall knew that he had to sort of find some detectives who worked in this division to help him out, but he couldn't do this alone. But this was really difficult because Stephanie was so liked, they had to find detectives who had no particular bias for or against her. Eventually they settled on two officers called Greg Stearns and Dan Jamarillo, or Amarillo. Sorry, I know that's probably Spanish. Um, they chose these men purely because they didn't know her that well and therefore they didn't really care if she was innocent or guilty. Um, so Robert Bubb and Jim bring the case files to Greg and Dan and they give them an overview of everything that's been going on, everything that's happened in the investigation since 1986. After they've done this, they head straight to the DA's office and tell the prosecutors who are gonna be handling this case what is going on. For the next week, this little team work out of a conference room at the DA's office. They can't work out of the park centre because Stephanie will be hanging around. And it was so important that this remained a secret. They have to figure out a plan. They can't just go into this blindly because obviously there's a lot of bias within the LAPD and they don't want to give anyone a chance to cover anything up. They can't let Stephanie know what's going on, but they can't just turn up at her desk and arrest her. In the end, they decide to stage a fake interview in the Parker Center's jail, which was like right in the basement, um, in the building where Stephanie worked. And this is on June 5th, 2009. So Greg and Dan on that day go up to Stephanie's desk and they say to her like, listen, you don't really know who, you, who we are, but we've got somebody we need to interview who says they might have information about an art theft. Would you want to come down with us and speak to this guy? Um, and they specifically chose to hold the interview down in the jail because it meant they would have to relinquish their guns. They take Stephanie into the interrogation room, which is equipped with cameras and recording equipment. And there's nobody else in there. It's pretty obvious from the get go that it's just the three of them. And everything I'm about to tell you is actually recorded and it is up on YouTube, which I'll link down below if you wanna go watch it. The interview with Stephanie in the interrogation room is about an hour and 10 minutes long. I won't know until I edit if I'm actually gonna put clips of that interview in this video or not, but it is definitely worth the watch. The interview's very long, but very, very interesting. Greg and Dan are smart about this interview. They sit Stephanie down in the interview room and they jump straight into it. They don't waste any time. They tell Stephanie they've been working on this particular case for a while and they outright ask her if she knows somebody called John Bruton. And I think they purposely mispronounce the name because Stephanie jumps straight back and she's like, John Rutten? Yeah, I know John Rutten. And they basically tell her that they wanted to talk to her away from like her desk in the office, um, away from any prying ears because it's about her ex-boyfriend, it's a bit of a sensitive subject. Um, and they don't want anybody to start gossiping. And at first, it doesn't seem like Stephanie has any idea where this is going. She's just like chatting away with them. But it doesn't take her long to sort of catch on to where they're going with this. Um, she keeps asking them like, what is all this about? Like, why are you talking to me? 
until they eventually bring up Sherry. And they ask if Stephanie and Sherry ever met. Stephanie says that she can't really remember because it was so long ago, she hasn't seen John in years, like how was she supposed to remember if she ever met John's wife? Um, and she repeats this multiple times throughout the interview, like her main thing that she keeps saying is like, oh it's a million years ago, I don't remember, I don't remember, like oh you're gonna have to let me think. But throughout the interview she lets more and more little details slip, things that she shouldn't be able to remember, but she does. Greg and Dan had to be very very careful with this interview because obviously Stephanie was an officer herself and was well aware of her rights to silence and legal counsel. She was a very sharp detective, she knew what she was doing. So their goal was just to keep her talking as long as possible until she clocked on and then stopped talking. I mean they kept assuring her like listen you're not under arrest, you're free to leave at any time, like we just want to chat, we're just trying to figure things out. Um, they couldn't be accusatory in any way because she would have just got defensive and got up and left. But at the same time she probably knew that if she did just get defensive and got up and left then it would make her look even more guilty. She was backed into a corner at this point and she probably knew that but she doesn't let it show, she remains pretty calm throughout the entire interview. Greg and Dan are basically just trying to get her to talk as much as possible, talk about her relationship with John, her relationship with Sherry, if they ever met, things like that and at some point the interview sort of like goes off a little bit and they start talking about like police work and like their private lives and then they sort of like bring it back but trying to keep it as casual and cool as possible and they keep telling Stephanie that she's free to leave any time which technically she was, she was able to leave the room any time. What she didn't know was that waiting right outside the door were some officers ready to arrest her the moment she walked out. Because at the end of the day, it didn't matter what she said in that room, they were just trying to get more information out of her. They had the DNA that linked her to the crime scene. Towards the end of the hour, Greg and Dan ask Stephanie for a DNA swab, and they say that they may have found some DNA at the scene and they just want to like, eliminate her. At this point she starts claiming that she can't believe she's being accused of this, she's offended and she says that she wants to contact a lawyer before giving any DNA and she walks out of the room before being stopped and immediately arrested. As soon as she's arrested the police start searching her house. They find all of her journals from the mid 80s which include multiple mentions of her love for John and how upset she was over his engagement. Her computer search history showed that she was searching for John Rutten's name on the internet multiple times throughout the late 90s. Most people in the LAPD couldn't believe that Stephanie Lazarus had been arrested for murder. This wasn't the kind of cop she was, she was a good upstanding citizen and a good upstanding police officer. After she's arrested she's held in the Los Angeles County Jail and she's formally charged with murder a couple of days after this and the LAPD actually allow her to retire early so her job isn't really an issue in this. Um, a bail hearing isn't set for almost six months and everyone is shocked when six months later she is set bail for 10 million dollars in cash. More than anyone had predicted, everyone thought that after the bail hearing she'd be allowed out. And the judge did have very good reason for setting her bail so high because like he said, she had a very big reason for wanting to flee the country if she is let out. The case against her was watertight, like nobody thought she was going to get away with this. And also her husband was a police officer himself, meaning that she had access to firearms and protection should she need it. It was too much of a risk to let her out. In the October, Stephanie's lawyer actually tried to have the entire case dismissed based on the grounds that Stephanie should have been identified as a suspect from the get-go. I mean if her name was brought up, why wasn't she a suspect? Why were people covering for her? Um, he said there was too much missing from the case file amongst other things, which of course there was, there was a lot missing from the case file but it didn't change the fact that her DNA was found on Sherry's body in the form of a bite mark. Um, but Stephanie Lazarus has actually maintained her innocence throughout, she's never admitted to any of this. The trial didn't start until early 2012 and it was an absolute media circus, it was huge, so huge that you've probably heard of this. Um, the case had everything that made a good story for the media, it had a love triangle, a murder and a scorned police officer. It was so so big. Um, prosecutors argued that the motive for the murder was jealousy over Sherry and John's relationship which we've probably all guessed already. Um, the police detectives who originally sort of investigated the murder were cross-examined and Stephanie's defence argued that there was no proof that it was Stephanie's own gun that was used. 38 calibre guns were common and Stephanie's gun had been stolen so there's no way to prove or disprove this, which the detectives realised when they first started looking into this case. The defence also attacked the bite mark evidence, saying that the envelope containing the DNA had been left for so long that somebody could have switched the DNA, somebody who had a problem with Stephanie. But the problem with this is nobody knew that her DNA was still in this freezer. Clearly somebody had gone to the effort of destroying most of the DNA evidence in this case. 
but they just happen to miss this one vial. If this person hadn't missed that vial, then Stephanie probably would still be walking free today. And there was no denying there was Stephanie's DNA in this tube. It was a one in seven sextillion match, which I didn't even know was a number. Um, they bring in character witnesses to say how unlike murder was for Stephanie's personality. She was never violent, but she did have a temper. And also it was pretty obvious that she was very, very obsessed with John Rutten. In the end, there was no denying that Stephanie had done this. She had no enemies who would have access to the coroner's freezer. Nobody knew the DNA was even in there. And she had a motive. She wanted John to herself. And if she couldn't have John, neither could anyone else. She was clearly having a very tough time with him being engaged to another woman. Like, she even wrote to John's mother, for God's sake. I'm gonna link down below as well the court documents for this case, The People versus Stephanie Lazarus. It's a very long read, but it's really, really interesting. It, it gives you a much bigger insight into, like, the actual court case in this. It's just really interesting. If you want to go read it, it'll be down there. Because Stephanie's always maintained her innocence, we still don't really know what went down that day. We don't know if Stephanie turned up the house to attack Sherry, if she turned up thinking that John would be home. But it does seem like whoever did this snuck into the house with a door maybe left unlocked and actually snuck up on Sherry in her own room, which is why the glass doors were shattered. And they were shattered from the inside, not the outside, because the glass all sort of like went outside the house. In March, after several days of deliberation, 52-year-old Stephanie is convicted of first degree murder, and she's later sentenced to 27 years to life in prison. She'll be eligible for parole in 2039. Um, throughout the trial it became very apparent there was a lot of police misconduct in this case and I'm not just talking about the murder, the LAPD are known for protecting their own and it seems like that is exactly what they did with this case. They didn't look into Stephanie at any point, they didn't like interview her like at all which would just be the done thing in this case even if they don't think she did it, at least interview her and cover your own backs. They hid any evidence of her name being mentioned, they destroyed any DNA of hers that could potentially be in this case. To me it seems like they actually believed that she did it because they went to so much effort to hide it. There have actually been two other lawsuits filed in this case based on these allegations that the LAPD were covering up. And one of these was by Nels and Loretta Rasmussen who said basically that it was all a massive cover up, they wanted the police to look into this. I mean, Nels told the police who the culprit was the day after the murder, and it still took them years and years and years to get anywhere. However, the statute of limitations in this case was up in the year 2000, so Nels and Loretta could no longer sue for this. Even though they didn't actually find out that Stephanie Lazarus was the killer until 2009, they weren't allowed to sue. But the other person to sue was actually Jennifer Francis. She claimed DNA evidence that she found was purposefully ignored by the LAPD. The detectives supervising her in this case like, verbally steered her away from looking into this anymore. And she said they made it quite obvious that like, they just were not interested. And she claimed that this isn't the only case where this has happened. She said that she's worked on multiple cases where DNA evidence has been ignored or changed to sort of fit the detective's view of the case. She said that in 2010, whilst everyone was preparing for Stephanie Lazarus's trial, she was questioned extensively by her supervisors about this case for any of the information that she'd found out. And she was actually forced by her supervisors to go to a counselling session because they thought that she was getting too emotionally involved. She was basically being gaslighted by her own employer. It seems like they were worried that she was going to cause a problem for them. And in the end, she was actually taken off a really high profile case because of this. She was working on the Grim Sleeper case, which is really interesting. I do want to cover it one day. Her supervisors tell her that she's obsessed and emotional and shouldn't have said anything about Stephanie in the first place when she was literally just doing her job. They even transfer her out of her position into a more non-analytical position. After this, she heads straight to the courts to file her lawsuit against the LAPD. And she's told that she can file a case based on the violation of state labour laws, but there were no triable issues on the fact of her claims of discrimination and retaliation. And this suit is still pending, it hasn't really gone anywhere since then as far as I could find out. Um, the Lazarus case goes up a hell of a lot higher than just Stephanie itself. Like, this is a long history of cover-ups within the LAPD. And although a reinvestigation actually was done by the department to find out if people did cover this up, obviously it came back as there was no cover-up. 
Stephanie to this day denies having any part of Sherry's murder and she argues that the botched burglary theory is much more viable than her doing it. She has appealed the court's decision but it was upheld because at the end of the day there's no denying that Stephanie Lazarus's saliva was on a bite mark on Sherry's arm. There's no other way of that getting there. And that is everything I have on Sherry's case for you guys. If you have any other requests for solved cases, then make sure you put them down below. Um, give this video a like if you like what I'm doing here and subscribe to my channel and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.